Well, it is something a lot of people face if they're ever hurt in an accident. They start working with insurance companies, and the insurance says, well, it's partially your fault, too, so we're not going to pay you as much. Can they do that? <laughs> How do you avoid that situation? Here with the answer, Attorney Phil Harding from Harding & Associates. You're here every Friday answering our legal questions. It's kind of like a, a legal course. I feel like we should get some sort of law certificate or something after these. Well, you should. <laughs> because you, know, you do get us up to date. We do, and we have the most educated viewers and you know maybe a couple more classes and we're going to hand out some degrees nice here. I yeah. like it I like it all right so today you're addressing a biggie I mean so many people have dealt with this maybe they've been in an accident and the insurance companies come in and they're trying to basically say hey um, you are partially at fault here so we're not going to pay you the full amount right and there are actually two things that we want to talk okay. about here uh, one is settlement negotiations and the other one is comparative fault okay. uh, and I hear almost weekly from viewers that get a call from someone and they say from the ingester and they've been hurt in this accident and they say you know the adjuster wants to reduce the amount that they pay me because they think that I'm partially at fault but how how is that really possible well, yeah, and I think we should do two things. Okay. I want to talk about two things. Okay. Um, and let's talk about the settlement negotiations first. All right. Now, the court system would rather have people work out their differences and take than take their dispute to court. Um, because of that, there's a rule of evidence called Rule 408. And 408 is very simple. And let me tell you what 408 says. It says, and I think we have a graphic that mm -hmm. we can yeah, say we'll exactly this. Um, and first of all, 408 says that evidence of the following, and there are two different things, is not admissible on behalf of any party. Number one, hmm. furnishing or offering consideration, and consideration is money, right? In compromising or attempting to compromise the claim, and number two, the conduct or statements made in the compromise negotiations regarding the claim. And so those two things are really important, and courts really want people to work out their own settlement because they think that they're going to be happier if they work out their own settlement than sure. have a court impose this on them. Before you go on, I, I want to clarify something. So it says that uh, those statements are not admissible. So can you just kind of relax about what you're saying <laughs> during these because it's not going to be admissible to court, or do you still need to be careful about that, what you say? That's a great question, and this is what I want everyone to know. Even though you're in and you're doing settlement negotiations, watch out for what you're saying because it's kind of like squeezing toothpaste out of the tube. Once it's out, it's <laughs> out there, right? Back in, right? So um, it's out there, and they can't say in the settlement negotiations you said this, but at least it's out and they know about it, and at that point, if you don't settle and they do a deposition, they can ask you about what you've said. Not during the settlement negotiations, but say, well, w was the light red or green? And if you said in the settlement negotiations that it was red, it's hard for you to go back on those words. So really the only thing that's allowable here under this, under this 408, and again, it's called CRE, which stands for Colorado Rules of Evidence 408. And the reason why is because they want people to work it out together. And they say that it's totally inadmissible. Number one, even if you had a settlement negotiations, but the numbers that were thrown around. Now let's talk about comparative fault. If you go to trial and it's determined that you're partially at fault, mm -hmm. now what the court is going to do is they're going to reduce the amount of that award based upon the percentage that you are at fault. Okay. And let's look at an example. Let's say you go through a jury trial and they award you $100,000, but they say you're 20% at fault. So what that means is really you only get 20%. So that's the comparative fault statute. Well, I guess that makes sense of how they arrive at that. But let's say I'm the person who was in the accident and I'm trying to say, look, I wasn't really 20% at fault. How are they going to prove that I was 20% at fault? Sure. And there are a lot of things to go on. And let's just go over an example okay. here. Okay. Let's say you're driving down the road and someone uh, runs through a red light. Right. And it's determined that you're speeding. And thus, they would say, well, you were speeding, so if you weren't speeding, number one, what we could do, you could have avoided the accident. Or number two, the other thing that you could have done is you wouldn't have been injured as much. Mm -hmm. So by determining if you were injured or not because of your speeding could reduce it by that 20% or more. And I want to point out another thing. If it's determined that you're 50% more or more at fault, you could never recover. Now, what we're looking at right here is called an EDR 
I want everyone to walk up to the screen. I know it's small and I apologize <laughs> for that, but this is one of those little black boxes that is in a car. So this is how they can prove that you were speeding and you are partially at fault. Exactly, and look at this. See the top thing, that top line? Now remember, this is one of 19 pages that comes out wow. of data. And the, first, the top one is the RPMs. So you can see someone was going slow and then all of a sudden they stepped on the accelerator. The next line is the speed. And as you can see, someone was slowing down and then they started to accelerate. And you can look, the RPMs dropped just about one second before. So this person saw the accident occurring about one second before. As you look down below, it shows you if the brake was engaged or not. And again, this graph shows that five seconds before the accident, someone had their brake on, and then three and a half seconds, they took the, their foot off the brake, stepped on the accelerator, started going, and then suddenly, if you keep on going right to the graph, you see at five tenths or a half, <laughs> Wow. before the accident, so this is they real, stepped on the brake. It's, it's like a black box that's in a lot of airplanes, and these are in, you're saying, most models of cars from the 90s on, so they, everybody has access. Um, when if they want to get this information, they can get it, and they can prove that you were a certain percentage at fault, right? Exactly. Interesting. So it's really important to get an attorney quick so that they can get this data or look at other data to determine who's at fault or if you're partially at fault. All right. I think I'm ready for my pop quiz. Okay. I, I followed you on that. Thank Next you so week. much. <laughs> All right. Well, if you have any legal questions for Phil, he wants to hear from you. You can log on to our website, coloradosbest.tv. You'll see his photo right there. Just click on it. You could submit your own legal questions to him. He takes the time to answer them all personally, and he might even address them right here on Colorado's Best. And if you'd like to contact Phil at his office, Harding & Associates, here's the number, 303-762-9500. You can also go to hlaw.org.